Okay, so the last unit that we covered was respiration, and now we're on photosynthesis. To synthesize something means to make it, and photo, of course, is the prefix that means light. So we're making something from light, and that's something that we're going to make is stored energy in the form of chemical energy. So plants take light energy and convert it into chemical energy and store it in the bonds of glucose. So thinking back to our equation from last time, okay, here we go. So, if we compare this, this equation to photos, uh, from photosynthesis to that of respiration, what I think you'll find is that one is the inverse of the other. reactions exist in this cyclical uh, pattern that we observe in day-to-day -day life. Plants, of course, accrue energy from sunlight, convert that into glucose, and then animals consume those plants and convert that energy into adenosine triphosphate. Plants can also take the glucose that they produce and actually perform cellular respiration, as we discussed previously. So in this particular lab, one of the experiments focused on the excess glucose that was produced and what was done with that excess glucose, how it was stored if it was not to be used at that exact moment. But primarily this lab focused on specific parts of one of the organelles of the plant that are utilized to accrue the sunlight that we will eventually convert into that chemical form of energy. So the first thing we need to talk about in photosynthesis is we need to talk about the organelle that is the chloroplast. Okay, so you learned extensively about this in lecture. Okay, you now hopefully know that both the light dependent and light independent reactions take place in the chloroplast. The light dependent take place in the thylakoid discs which, which are stacked into grana, the stacks of the thylakoid discs. And the light independent reaction, or the Calvin cycle as it's known, takes place in the stroma, that dense fluid surrounding those thylakoid discs. And we're not going to be talking extensively about those. Instead, what I want to talk about are the pigments housed in the chloroplast. And those pigments, there are four of them that I want to discuss. Okay. Those pigments are... Chlorophylls, so we've got two of them, B and A. Then we've got the carotenoids, we've got xanthophyll, and carotene. Okay. Well, the chlorophylls primarily are the pigments involved in absorbing the light that will eventually be converted into glucose. Or, or be used actually, I'm sorry, will be used to actually perform all of the necessary processes to give us the um, byproducts NADPH and ATP needed to fuel carbon fixation and produce glucose. Xanthophyll and carotene are primarily used to absorb any additional or excess light that might otherwise damage these two pigments. Okay, so these are more protective of these. These are primarily utilized by the chloroplast to accrue the light that will be used um, to fuel the initial processes 
um, that we will use to produce NADPH and adenosine triphosphate. All right, so we've got these different pigments. And these are all inside of uh, the chloroplast, which is inside of a cell, which is inside of a leaf. So the first exercise in the lab was meant to or intended to analyze the relative absorbance spectrums of and transmittance spectrums of these pigments. So what we did was we took two different um, solutions, and these two different solutions were extracts. One of these solutions was a spinach extract, and one was a carrot extract. All right, so think about real quick what color you expect the spinach extract to be. Okay, it's going to be green. And then think about what color you expect the carrot extract to be. It's going to be orange. Okay, so thinking about those colors in terms of absorbance and transmittance, let's first start small, and I'll come back to these pigments here in a second. Okay, let's start small and let's talk about what we don't expect these two extracts to be very good at absorbing in terms of relative wavelengths and colors. Okay, so as you said, spinach is green, which means that green light is being transmitted while other colors of the spectrum, the visible spectrum of light are being absorbed. So if we look at a spinach extract, and we see that green color, that means that the green uh, wavelengths of the visible spectrum of light are being transmitted and not absorbed by those pigments inside of the chloroplast. Okay? So we expect to see a high transmittance at the wavelengths that correspond to green. And I'm going to leave it up to you to go research those particular wavelengths which means we also expect to see a very low absorbance at those wavelengths that correspond to green. Okay, similarly with the carrot, we expect to see a very high transmittance at the wavelengths that correspond to orange, and we expect to see a low absorbance at those wavelengths that correspond to orange. All right, so now let's get down to, more specifically, how we did this and what we really expected to see. So first off, the way in which we did these extracts was they were pre-prepared. And basically, spinach was taken and placed inside of a solution called acetone. Acetone extracted the pigments, spinach leaves were removed, and what we're left with is a combination pigment and acetone. Same thing was done for carrot. So the way in which you obtained your transmittance and absorbance was by using the spectrophotometer. You can look over the video protocol on how to use that machine if you forgot. But what we did was we first needed to make sure that if we're going to look at the absorbance or transmittance of these two sets of pigments, that we are not taking into consideration acetone. In other words, we want to make sure that if we see a certain absorbance for this extract or a certain transmittance, that that absorbance and transmittance completely hinges upon the ability of the pigment to absorb light or not absorb light. Okay, we do not want the acetone or the test tube that this is housed in to have an effect on the absorbance or transmit. So what we first did was we created a tube that was known as the blank. Okay, and the blank should contain everything except the particular material, substance, molecule, or ion that we expect is doing the absorbing or that we want to analyze the absorbance and transmittance of. So our blank contained a test tube and inside that test tube, we put acetone. We put this into the spectrophotometer, and we set the spectrophotometer to 100% transmittance for the blank. Basically, we're setting it to where all of the light is passing through the blank sample, so then when we place these in, we can see how much that amount of light decreases at each wavelength. 
And then what you did was you went from 400 in 25 nanometer increments all the way up to 700. So 400, 425, 450, 475, 500, so on and so forth through all of these. And you constructed a spectrum in a graph, basically, of these different wavelengths. So this range of wavelengths along with the percent transmittance and the absorbance that you expected to see or that you observed at each of those wavelengths for both spinach and carrot. Ideally, and in your book, what we typically see is that the chlorophylls tend to absorb light closer to the purple and blue wavelengths of the spectrum, while the carotenoids tend to absorb a little farther down the spectrum. To some degree, blue, some green, but for the most part, the majority of absorbance by your two chlorophylls is going to happen closer to the wavelengths that correspond to blue and purple. For the carotenoids, you're going to see more absorbance happening closer to the green, maybe the blue end of the spectrum, but once you reach orange and red, definitely not. Occasionally also you might see a spike by the two chlorophylls around the red wavelengths. Um, so I would recommend that you actually consult your book. Okay, look in your lecture book and find this graph. And that will show you what you would have expected to have seen in this experiment. And what I think you'll find is the majority of your results actually do kind of mimic exactly what you expect to see based off of the text. So that experiment was simply to define how well these pigments absorbed or transmitted light at various wavelengths. Okay, our spinach, primarily we were looking at the chlorophylls, but spinach leaves can contain those carotenoids as well. In the carrot, we were specifically looking primarily at those carotenoids and their ability to absorb or transmit light. Okay, remember also, absorbance and transmittance are inversely related, so if I'm seeing very high absorbance levels, then I expect to see very low transmittance levels. If I see very low absorbance levels, I expect to see very high transmittance levels. Okay, so that was the first experiment.